Hello everyone, welcome to Shriram IIS. So, Shiva Shankari here, and I'm here connected with you for your environment classes. Right? So, before going to our classes, you can see this uh, that Shriram is now on an academy platform, and you can avail the benefit uh, of 50% offer by using the code Shrirams. And you can join for any UPSC subscriptions, right? Also, we are very proudly announcing our uh, results. These are the top scorers of uh, from Shrirams IAS and much more are there. So we expect you also be the next year the topper of our academy, right? Now uh, this is about my, myself. You can see this, this is Shiva Shankri. My name is Shiva Shankri as well as I, I am also called as Shiva Ignatius. I have written a book for environment uh, with Pearson. You can also check that for more updates in the book. The pattern uh, related to the UPSC pattern the book was written. And I am uh, teaching in the UPSC field for the past eight plus years. And I'm handling a lot of subjects like ethics as well as environment is my main focus area along with the PSR optional. Apart from this, I'm also having, uh, you know, I'm a women entrepreneur. I'm having a company of my own and these are my personal profile. So that's not my, nothing much to discuss here because I'm also owning a foundation and I'm also uh, a modern artist to say. Okay. So now what is our plan? So far we've done three classes for uh, rapid revision. And this is a series so this is the fourth one which we have to do and the rest of our chapters which we have to touch is left over in this so like i like to uh, you know bring back those three uh, series what we have done so far so when you are going to revise your chapters because you are nearly uh, nearing the prelim state when you are going to revise the environment chapters how will you going to do it as i have done for you you have to split it four the three part is over that one part is talking about the introduction, like all those concepts, like uh, the ecosystem concepts, okay? So, which we have done in the first chapter revision. Second is talking about, we just touch the main areas like the climate change, okay? Environmental issues, which the last uh, rapid revision series, which I have done. And the next one is about the ecosystem itself, the types of ecosystem. Either it can be a terrestrial, either it can be a... Uh, aquatic ecosystem so we have done uh, those which is required and those from which questions are appearing i have done in my series now here i am connected for you uh, sorry i am connected in this class for biodiversity and allied sectors so what are those topics which will appear biodiversity where we have to focus and where it is expected you know what what are the topics which are expected in the forthcoming the prelims which is nearing that only I'm going to discuss today. So you have to get connected, connect with me in this class continuously throughout the classes. I will be giving you inputs that what are the questions which may be expected this year, how you have to prepare, how you have to arrange your preparation. So here we are going to split into two parts. Part one is the biggest part which we'll be doing. In the part one part, what we are going to do, we are going about biodiversity. So what are those uh, things which we have to focus related to the flora, fauna and others, Anna? and also the measures to protect these people. Okay, so that we'll be seeing in the part one and the part two is completely related to the other sectors like we can take agriculture for example, you can take energy sector, okay. And uh, even the science and technology, the new innovations for, um, you know, fighting against the climate change to mitigate the effect of climate change. These all will be put under part two. So we'll begin with part one that's biodiversity so to say some uh, basic concepts related to biodiversity you should know so that i have put here so biodiversity is nothing but it's some variability we are seeing among the living organisms that's called as biodiversity diversity variations between living organisms so that is called biodiversity and there are three types of biodiversity as you can see here i have mentioned the first one we call this as genetic diversity and the second is species diversity and third is ecosystem diversity. That means the genetic diversity, if you see, nothing but like uh, within the same species, the variation in genes. And we all are humans only, but we don't look similar. There is, there is some variation. Same way, every type, so you take oranges, different types of oranges are there, different types of apples are there, that we call as genetic diversity. And species diversity means, it's like in a particular place, how many number of species is present and how rich that place is that we call this species richness and the abundance and types okay all this will decide a species diversity of a particular place okay 
and uh, uh, you know uh, for that we have done a lot of classes also no it, we have to explain we need not explain everything basically but generally to say if you take a particular ecosystem how number of uh, you know let us take a pond the fishes present the amphibians present the reptiles which are present there okay like this we are calculating the number of species different types of species which are present that called a species diversity then what is ecological diversity or ecosystem diversity it means the different types of ecosystems for example forest is one kind of ecosystem same way you go into a uh, mangrove uh, mangrove is a different kind of ecosystem although it is a forest it's a different kind of ecosystem okay even it's a transition zone we call and uh, you go to a desert it's a different kind of ecosystem that means the climatic factors okay and uh, all the other even the physio physiological factors physiographic factors all these decides the play the particular ecosystem what it should be okay and the distribution also depends on that particular ecosystem this is called as ecosystem diversity okay this is the third diversity which we, i want to uh, discuss with you then come to the variation in diversity you know this already upsc has asked and again there might be a chance of repetition so you have to be very careful when you take you know we always think that why there are certain places which is very rich in uh, species but certain places where there are less number of species present that's why we said that the factors lot of factors are deciding that like the climatic factors is one such factors soil properties another such factor then physiographic factors and uh, even the uh, distribution of species itself is also deciding okay if one species is present in that area another will not be present so it may be a direct competitor and there will be limited resources and all so based on this only the species are distributed for generally we say that from the equator we move towards the poles okay we have less number of species the diversity also is very less the richness is also less the abundance is also less generally if i want to say like this it it everything is less when you are moving from the equator towards the poles same way when you are starting from mountain that is the, from the base towards the, you are moving towards the top you know so that also you can see that generally the number of species also will be less the richness also will be less diversity also will be less so everything as you go up is less okay then see then we come to the main area if you are going to study about biodiversity straightly take some species which appeared in the last year uh, current affairs that is in the newspaper you might have read in the newspaper or any uh, you know uh, government sites like pabs or anywhere some projects would have been started or that species would have been discussed then catch it study something related to that even it's not uh, you know end of the day no we still have time to go you you know in order in order to clear this exam it doesn't mean that you have to prepare everything how much papers you are getting it doesn't matter at all how much questions you have in hand that is that matters much okay so you your preparation has to be in that manner only see in this case if you take your old upsc question paper lot of questions are related to this species in a way such that this uh, questions appear in this manner they either give a species and then they describe about the species in statements number 1 okay for example karai camel you take indian rhino you take indian elephant you take the questions are there in the question paper so they will give statement number 1 the elephant uh, you know uh, will call the uh, will give that is that means it feeds the uh, calf till this much years and the gestation period of the elephant they live in solitary or not and you take an uh, rhino rhino's uh, characters you know the character of that animal or uh, distribution of the animal i am telling for an animal then i will come to the plant also the distribution of the animal or you know the um, any specific unique character about that species will be given in the statement for example one time they asked about karai camel karai camel is having a peculiar character it will swim in the water and all to feed on the mangroves okay so this way you have to watch for the unique things about that particular animal and the distribution which national park they are present okay in which area they are naturally found either only in india or outside india also they can be naturally found one time this was also a statement there like indian rhino for example they said indian rhino is naturally present in india only specifically they gave this that is wrong no so that how you have to note for these statements when you are preparing then also like uh, sometimes what they will do they will only ask about a national park okay this animal is naturally found in 
then they will give four national parks or wildlife sanctuary and ask to pick up the right answer like for example one time they asked about barasinga musk deer you know not only one time several times these types of questions has appeared or they will give which of the following animals are naturally found in india they do not pick up from randomly from somewhere in the slot and all it would have appeared in the news okay that is why i'm asking you to check for the uh, species which has appeared in the last one year current uh, affairs that is newspapers not any government sites now we'll go to the plant for how what type of questions will appear for the plant for the plant if they are asking not one question or two question already they started from uh, himalayan nettle taxus tree uh, the neem tree they have asked very recently they last year they have asked about tamarind tree and moringa tree okay even red sanders also has come so we are starting from plant see i am giving a, a sample also for you with a few uh, topics which appeared in the current affairs and i am discussing here for the red sanders you take how we have to prepare it's a emic tree if you have to look for the tree and it's a endemic tree where it belongs to it belongs to only in the eastern it's restricted only to east eastern ghats so you have to be checking this statement okay this was under endangered category under iucn sometimes question appear like this which are the following category endangered species uh, as per iucn and uh, even for uh, trees also they ask when you walk from uh, the uh, uh, base of the himalayas to the top of the himalayas which are the trees naturally found in india naturally found okay so that means which lives in the in that particular place naturally you can see them when you walk then oh, uh, these are some of the threats smuggling is the main threat uh, for red sanders we can see and uh, also the invasive species like this again and uh, the uses then come to the uses if you are talking about a tree they will generally focus on the whether it is endemic to certain area or not or whether that uh, uh, tree is categorized as endangered or something like under iucn then they will come to uses only they will say this can be used for biofuel making uh, even the leaves can be used for this purpose and it has the anti diuretic property this way they will try to ask questions so for red sanders mainly for cosmetic purposes only and also medicinal property also it has medicinal property also sorry then these are some additional information which you can uh, look into okay right then come to the next uh, uh, tree see this only few trees i will discuss few uh, species matti tree i hope this you would have never seen but it was uh, in discussion under uh, a prop uh, uh, a popular magazine so matti tree was there and this is endemic tree again like how we saw about red sanders it is also endemic to the western ghats we saw uh, red sanders is endemic to eastern ghats this person is endemic to western ghats and uh, this tree if you see it looks like a crocodile skin this is the main uh, you know difference between this tree and the other tree and this tree is something called as uh, you know water making tree water making tree by uh, particular tribal people called as kurubas they call this as water making tree because when you cut the uh, bark uh, of this tree around uh, you know uh, tears of water you can harvest from this tree so those who are uh, not having any water and you know, are walking in the forest they will go and fetch water from this tree so it's very unique no and beard also so this type of uh, thing will be noted by upsc they are asking they'll be asking this and the bark if you see it i already told it resembles a crocodile skin so it is used as a medicine also for diarrhea they are using this as a medicine and also the leaves of this tree you know it is fed to the silk worms and uh, especially the tasar silk one of the wild silk you know so the silk worm eats this uh, leaves of this tree and uh, they also live so this way it is useful in various ways and uh, as you can see the fruit also spirogalal and catechol and this is used to dye and tan the leather so tanning the leather is also done using this particular tree so this way you have to uh, note only the unique thing about that okay not everything yeah don't do that so now come to the next one called as bayon uh, and this called as uh, boon also or bayon also anyway in the local language they call this in this way but this tree is called as chinar tree generally we call this as chinar very beautiful tree as to say and uh, you know this is called as as um, speaking tree also in uh, kashmir they call this as a speaking tree because the leaves no it makes some kind of sounds that breaks the silence huh? so this one unique character of this tree if you see i have put up a red tree here for you same way the chinar leaves turns into different colors starting from green to yellow then to red it turns its color huh? like chameleana so that way it looks very beautiful and for that only it is very popular why i put this tree is that recently a census has been started in india for geo tagging of chinar trees okay around 2021 they have started and it will be completed by 2023 
So anytime they may just take this china tree and they may say that china tree is useful for this, that and all. You have to be very clear. It's a beautiful tree, like an ornamental tree. Although it has some uses, okay, it has also some medicinal properties where the bark and the leaves will be used for eye inflammation only, okay. Other than that, we do not know much about this uh, medicinal property of this tree and all. So if they are giving many things like they, it will cure cancer, it will cure this, careful. It, it only cures the eye inflammation. And this tree uh, also makes a particular place a beautiful, uh, beautiful like Dal Lake you take in Srinagar. There is something inside the Dal Lake called as Char Chinar. It's called as Char Chinar, that island, a beautiful small island which is present. And in that island, there are four char, uh, Chinar trees in the four corners we say. So that's, it makes it, it beautiful also. So this way, uh, we, we have some information about Chinar, okay. Then we will go to the next one, see this one. It don't look very good or beautiful like Chinar, but it's called as a desert, a desert tree. And it is, uh, you know, very useful tree, we can say. Okay, it's a tree of the poor also, it's called tree of the poor people. Because, you know, this is the lifeline of people of Rajasthan, especially in the driest area, this tree will tolerate the drought situation also. And even it can uh, survive in, uh, you know, it can withstand a severe cold also and hot temperatures also. And at the same time, it provides a lot of use to the people, like providing firewood and uh, even... Even, you know, uh, the leaves of this tree are used as, used as fodder for the cattle, okay. They will feed the cattle and uh, it's also used for compost as a compost also. And, he, and the fire, you, woods are used as a firewood, okay. The bark is used for certain uh, medicinal properties. Like this, it is giving a lot of benefits to the people. And further, you have to note this tree enriches the soil, okay. So that means the tree has certain fertilizing capability, okay. For uh, one time, they used like... Uh, Neem. Neem is acting as a bio-pesticide, bio-insecticide and all know. So, they asked about that particular term and even uh, when they are ta taking certain um, like moringa and tamarind, they said that it is used for making biofuels. Okay, so you have to be very careful and this tree enriches the soil. So, it improves the soil fertility also. In this way, this is called as lifeline or the desert tree. Then animals. Okay, this much is enough related to tree. Now, I am talking about an animal. That is first I want to discuss about this gigantic and majestic one, the Indian rhino. He often appeared in the news as long term back, long time back it was asked in UPSC. So again there is a chance of appearing again. If you see first I already told when you are studying about an animal, you should know some uh, character of that animal, the, what it eats, uh, and, uh, the habitat of the animal, the, whether it stays in a woodland or in a forest or in a uh, lake or something, that you have to know and what it eats. Okay, note these points and keep and set the second, the distribution, where it is found, whether it is naturally found in India or not. And if it is found, which place we, you can see him, whether it is endemic to certain area and if so, in which national park you can find him or which wildlife sanctuaries and all you can find him. And the conservation status of that animal, you have to know and above all the threat also. Okay, in that case, see this animal, it, the IUCN has given vulnerable, previously he was in endangered status, now we, are, we have protected him to some extent and he became vulnerable, he has now put under vulnerable status and even under the Wildlife Protection Act, we have put under uh, him under Schedule 1, Schedule 1 and sites under Appendix 1, okay. So, he is found in India and Nepal and even Bhutan also, you know, add Bhutan also here, so he is found not only in India but in Nepal and Bhutan also, sorry. And in India, you can see these are some of the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. You can generally see him. If in the places, if I want to tell Assam, Assam and West Bengal and even in UP, you can find this person. And apart from India, you can find in Nepal and Chitwan National Park and Bhutan in Royal Manas National Park. Okay. So, the main unique character, uh, peculiar, um, you know, feature of this animal is that his Han, the one Han he possesses, no? You can see him, it, it's made, uh, it's simply like uh, around 3 kilogram uh, of uh, weight, this uh, harness. Even if it is broken, it will regrow again, okay. And this, he is using it in search of food uh, and search of roots, okay. And this, um, you can see, especially they prefer flood plains. Near the river, they will stay or they prefer grasslands a lot. And you can also see him in the woodland and also... Uh, the mineral licks. That's why I said he is always semi-aquatic. He want water also, he want land also. So, he will be in the swamp areas. Okay. Most of all, he will be found in the riverine side only. Okay. And these animals are usually solitary in nature except for the females. Huh? 
then come to the next one the red panda the cute, this cute shy animal it's he is also very solitary creature and you can this is categorized as endangered under iucn category if you see him he is put under endangered category and also uh, under sites he is coming under appendix 1 okay and in wildlife protection act it under schedule 1 so uh, in india where can you find him previously he was found through all the northern belt you can see him okay but now he is found only in the singalika and uh, sorry singalila and uh, neora valley national park only these two national parks you can see him in the uh, nature okay so in the wild if you go to singalila national park and neora valley national park and you are very lucky you will meet him and the two protected areas and this endangered mammal is found in the uh, wild in west bengal this national park is in west bengal then you see they are apart from national uh, apart from west bengal they are found in nepal and bhutan also okay and even in the mountains of uh, the southern part of china myanmar they are living okay and they prefer only forest either it be deciduous forest or a coniferous forest and they live at the altitude of 2000 everything is here no so i am not noting it see this uh, 2200 to 4000 meter above the sea level you can find them and they prefer only bamboo shoots previously they also eat uh, insects and uh, small eggs of uh, uh, birds and you know birds and all but now they are only preferring for bamboo shoots and they are acting as a indicator species for ecological change also so if they are gone then the health of that particular place is completely uh, deteriorated it means okay that is called ind indicator species so uh, they their uh, their number drastically got reduced so the padmaja national park no which is in the highest national park of our country uh the sorry zoological park padmaja padmaja naidu park at the height of around 2000 meters above the sea level they took an initiative and uh, rewilding of uh, uh, red panda took place that will that means they will uh, take care of the red panda they will grow the red panda in captivity then we will release him in the wild so that way this program was started and uh, even there was one data see this and be noted by upsc so they concluded that both the species there are two species subspecies of red panda one is himalayan red panda and another is chinese red panda that two va variation both are in india okay and the siang river in arunachal pradesh is uh, trying to split them okay india has both species so uh, if you go to the arunachal pradesh area you can also find the chinese red panda and in the uh, himalayan red panda is also present in uh, india okay so this way and but mostly now previously they were found throughout uh, the northern belt but now they are only restricted to few places actually in the two national parks you can find in the major majority uh, way okay then you come to the next one this is you all know the bustard the great indian bustard so he is, this person is listed in the schedule 1 of indian uh, you know schedule 1 of wildlife protection act and even the sites and cms everybody has listed under appendix 1 and this uh, bird is also critically endangered under iucn okay often appeared in the uh, news so its population has previously it was present throughout the uh, central india and but now they are restricted to rajasthan and gujarat and even small population will be finding in maharashtra karnataka andhra and all you will find small population but mainly they are present in rajasthan and gujarat and is uh, the park which they are present is desert national park in rajasthan so this way only questions are appearing no already I gave you in what pattern questions are appearing so be careful while reading it and uh, it's the heaviest bird that can fly one of the heaviest bird which can fly and uh, this is a peculiar character of this bird the booming call which it makes you no know? it can be heard up to 500 meter also and this is a ground dwelling bird and uh, they also prefer open landscapes okay so grasslands is the main preferable area of these bird and they find grass seeds berries even insects also some one time you pay say ask this as a question that the diet of the particular animal was asked okay so threats and all hunting disturbances these are the threats and fragment and loss of habit and the last species which we are going to see under this is snow leopard and very recently uh, you know ibca was also proposed uh, international bio uh, alliance and all okay so that uh, you have to be very careful so, uh, maybe the question uh, even project tiger breeding the 50th year instead of asking going to project tiger i i bought ibca they may turn to snow leopard also because he is one of the big cat who is present in india so as of him he is vulnerable in status only he is not endangered or critically endangered like uh, the rhino he is also vulnerable 
but sites has posted him under appendix 1 you know no when when he is posted under appendix 1 that means the trade is not allowed you cannot trade for uh, uh, normal reason and all only exceptional cases you have to take permission from sites and then it can be done and even uh, wpa has put under schedule 1 so that way it has been given highest protection and it's described as the ghost of mountain okay and is master of uh, camouflage also so he covers himself in the snow in a nice manner and goes for hunting so that's why he is called as master of camouflage and uh, you know um, snow leopard is identified as a flagship species for the high altitude himalaya so he is that uh, species who is uh, representing the himalayan mountains okay so flagship species already we have discussed in our previous videos and all you would have seen that and uh, in India, if you take, they are present through Western Himalayas and even the Jammu Kashmir areas, you can find them, Ladakh and Himachal, Uttarakhand, every that uh, Himalayan states, you can find them and uh, in the Eastern Himalayas also he sent. Then you come to projects, if I am discussing about uh, leopard like that, snow leopard, then you have to know that project snow, uh, snow leopard was launched in 2009, okay, so 15th year this year, that's why instead of asking tiger they may also focus on snow leopard so this uh, the main aim of this project the project snow leopard is to conserve okay and protect this uh, species the population to increase their population and to protect the habitat okay so how to through participatory method only we also should involve the local people and the government together they have to protect them along with the, some private bodies and CSOs also and this uh, particular snow leopard, no, you take, it's, uh, uh, you know, it is found in the five Himalayan states, you have to note, like these are the five Himalayan states, okay, right. And here the national level, uh, the, the project is coordinated by various committees, like uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forest officials will also be present and the government and the non, I already told you, research organizations, forest departments, everyone is together, participatory way, trying to protect the species. Okay, now that's all uh, related to the species. So I have given some um, major input about the animals plus the plants. Now come to the services offered by biodiversity. What are the benefits you are reaping from biodiversity? Okay, you have to know in that manner. To say that every organisms which are present in the ecosystem is giving something and taking something. Okay, that's the thing that is give and take only. So, they give certain advantage to the ecosystem and they reap some eco benefit from the ecosystem. And that way, if you see, that balances, you know, uh, the um, food chain. You can say like that and the ecosystem balance. It is very much important to maintain an ecosystem balance. Without that species, you know, then I already told you the food chain will get completely altered and uh, it is creating a negative impact on the uh, system, okay. Same way, uh, this is seen as a reservoir where like uh, you, you are taking a food. No, food is from a biodiversity only and uh, even woods from trees only. Medicines from them, from the uh, any any kind of animals or any kind of trees, you are trying to extract a medicine. So, this way they use various ways for humans as well as they are coexisting with humans. That only you have to keep in mind. Then how we are going to conserve them? The main problem is threat. No, there are various different kinds of threat. Some species are threatened due to habitat fragmentation, some due to poaching, hunting, logging, illegal logging, trees and all if you take. So, this way various kind of threats they are facing. Huh? Sometimes uh, even the uh, uh, that coexisting species is dead and this also go vanished and all. That way we, we are having a lot number of threats related to biodiversity. How we are going to conserve them? That is the next uh, thing which we have to take. So, for that in situ conservation and ex situ conservation, there are two types of conservations. In situ means where the animal is present. We are saying no, nat naturally they are present in these areas and all. So, when they are present in that particular area, we are just trying to protect the entire area in order to safeguard this organ. That is called in situ conservation. So, for that purpose only, the government is announcing national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, you would have seen. Huh? Then, ex situ conservation means from that place, already they are severely threatened you take a cheetah they gone extinct and all extinct so now we are borrowing from another country not from our own country itself a species is not present so uh, same way uh, a species which is completely threatened and only 50 numbers are present in the wild what they will do they will try to take them in captivity and they will try to raise i already told rewildening of red panda mainly we are doing for that only we are growing it in a uh, zoological park 
we are taking care of him in a zoological park after it grows and comes to certain age then it is released into the wild okay so that's called excite to conservation for that purpose only we are having botanical gardens zoological parks wildlife safaris and all now come to uh, I, I, the conservation measures how we are going to discuss our conservation measures first i will uh, bring all the conventions acts rules regulations which are present related biodiversity conservation see those which are very basic and which are required i will discuss here and in the current related and all i have already done a marathon session for you and if there is something present i have already given there you can also watch that even in this also i have some topics okay same way uh, that uh, after this we will be going for bodies organizations and schemes of programs if so okay this way we are going to discuss the conservation measures of biodiversity in that first time we'll start with the biggest convention which is existing for biodiversity is UN, UN convention on biological diversity shortly we call this a cbd so it, this particular uh, cbd that is uh, here after i'm going to say only cbd this un convention is a international legally binding instrument i can say like that main purpose of bringing this convention is to conserve the biological diversity okay not only for that to sustainably use them and to share the benefit with everyone okay three things you keep in mind one to conserve the biodiversity second to use them in a sustainable way okay not completely extracting all the people and then using it for your own huh? killing all the red pandas making red pandas making your hat what it means red pandas if it if they go then the species which are dependent on them is also from the environment so sustainably using them use of its component deriving some component from someone then that also you have to take in the sustainable way and fair and equitable sharing of the benefit which is arising from the usage of the genetic resources okay this is for this main three purpose these are the three aims for which the cbd was brought okay so these are important and uh, if you say that uh, this was proposed during the 1992 years summit only already i told you we also discussed two more conventions no unccd and unfccd for climate change along with that both that is a convention for uh, desertification no to combat desertification same way the climate change convention along with this they also proposed this convention on biological diversity and uh, it entered into force around 1993 it entered into force and india joined this convention in 1994 so that's why it, uh, in the year wise classification also this convention is very important so as of now 196 countries has ratified and this which we have already discussed you now these are the main goals and we have done it and more about cbd if you want to know then it it means there is one point which you have to keep in mind that cbd covers the biodiversity at all levels all levels we discuss three types of biodiversity you no know, species genetic diversity species diversity ecosystem diversity so it covers biodiversity at all levels and also it is the first time it recognizes the conservation conserving of the biological diversity along with the human kind okay that means humans are part of biodiversity and you cannot separate a human from a biodiversity uh, sorry separate a human from that particular place in order to protect a biodiversity that is affirmed by this uh, convention of biological diversity only okay so then uh, this already i have said it is a legally binding agreement and all so all this has been given here and uh, now this he has got over and we are talking about the global biodiversity framework i have already done a, a separate topic for that also even the marathon session i have mentioned you can check for the global biodiversity framework in the montreal uh kunming uh, pro, uh, meeting it has been decided and after this after he they are going to take over okay which has 23 targets and four long term goals as we have discussed huh? then uh, under the conventions you can see there are two protocols under the cbd there are two protocol one is cartagena protocol and the other is nagoya protocol you can see here cartagena and nagoya if you take cartagena protocol for what they brought this protocol the cartagena protocol which was proposed around 2000 and entered into force around 2003 okay this protocol which was proposed during 2000 and entered into force in 2003 mainly for bio safety to the convention on biological diversity for this reason only they brought that means in simple terms if you want to remember you can put car and connect cartagena car okay lmo that is living modified organisms this people when they are trying to get transfer from one place to another and through uh, the, any transport only you are going to move him so you just imagine car 
So you are going to move that modified organism from one place to another and they will pose threat to that particular ecosystem. In order to stop that, they brought this protocol. Okay. So it's an international treaty which is governing the movement of living modified organisms, LMOs. That is called living modified organisms. So when in because in the biotechnology, no, we are creating new, new, new methods. We are deriving uh, now we are talking about bioplastics. In the future, different, different things we will bring. So, uh, when we are trying to make something in a different manner uh, using the biotechnology, then we are using the organisms there and they get modified because of that. And this modified organism, if they get spread out, it may pose threat to the nat native species or the biodiversity or even to human health it is going to affect. So, in order to protect that only, they have brought this protocol. And uh, India is also a signature to this Cartagena protocol. India has already ratified it. Around 2003, we have ratified this. Again, its year-wise classification is very important. Okay, almost 10, uh, 20th year. So, this protocol seeks to uh, protect uh, mainly from the, the di biological diversity from the risk posed by the living modified organisms, which are resulting from the biotechnology. That is the main aim of this. For that purpose only, they have <coughs> they established a clearing. See, this biosafety clearing house. Okay, for what reason they have brought this to facilitate that means to exchange the information on uh, about the living modified organisms. Uh, so, uh, it will help the countries know. Suppose this organism is taken from one place to another. What are the threat we are going to face because of this? If it gets released out, then that information has to be shared between the both the countries. That is that is why we are having this biosafety clearing house and all to, uh, to exchange the information. Okay, and based on this protocol, we the parties will go into AIA procedure that is advanced informed agreement procedure. So, through this only necessary information will be exchanged between the countries. Okay. See then the NAG protocol that is Cartagena and come to Nagoya. They are like two arms of this convention. Okay. One is Cartagena, another is Nagoya of CBD. Nagoya protocol is about uh, benefit sharing. We told no that we have when we are der deriving certain benefit from the genetic uh, resources, we have to have the benefit with everyone. For that purpose, this Nagoya protocol was brought. In shortly, we say this is ABS. But what is the full form is access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization. We gener generally shortly call this as access to genetic resource and benefit sharing. That is called ABS. And this convention of this biological diversity, again, it's a supplementary agreement only under the CBD. And this came into force around, you know, 2000. 14, 2014 it came into force. It was produced in 2010 and it came into force in 2014. So, this particular protocol is there to ensure that whether the um, genetic resources which are derived from a particular places has provided benefit to all the, uh, has uh, given a equitable benefit to the people who are uh, living there, who are, who belong to that area, that way it will try to check. So, it is a legal, again a legal framework only. And again, you can see this GEF, the Global Environmental Facility is serving as a financial mechanism to the Nagoya Protocol. Okay, India also is signatory and ratified this kind of protocol around 2014. The moment it entered into force, India became member of that protocol also. Okay, and based on this only, a lot of guidelines has been notified under this. Okay, and uh, uh, you know, prior to this itself, we have formed the, uh, we have brought a, con we have brought an act, National Biodiversity Act, we have brought. And that only we are going to see that Biological Diversity Act 2002. Again, year-wise classification, this is important. That's why I have put here. So, this act is mainly for that to conserve the uh, biological diversity only. See, already I have said several times in our previous rapid revision class also, when we are talking about a convention or an act, what are the points you have to into? You have to look for the, uh, you know, whether India is a member to that or not. Either India is, a, in the last case, CBD we are talking. Whether India is, has ratified its convention and the supplementary protocols of the convention. Yes, all the three get passed by India. Same way, is there any uniqueness? Uh, sometimes they will give, go for opt-out position and all in the convention. Whether India has done in that way anything or not, you have to be careful. And uh, you also should know that, uh, you know, um, when this uh, has entered into force, specifically for our own uh, benefit, we are knowing that. And the EA, mainly the objective of the convention, for what purpose they have been brought out. And any unique sentence there, any peculiar statement they have made under the uh, site. So, that and all you have to, because one time they have asked that this is a participatory convention where every people has to be involved. You know, like as CBD also, we said the same thing. 
instead of segregating human from that particular uh, ecosystem we are going to uh, you know benefit the people also and benefit the ecosystem also in that way only we have brought the cbd so participation is important there local without local participation nothing can be done and in all also to support the livelihood of the people to assure and to ensure that uh, their rights we have brought this convention that way you have to be careful while reading uh, the conventions or acts okay now we are going to act so when i am reading the act when i am just discussing the act i will just tell you what are those points you have to focus here and this act was mainly for brought in order to give shape to cbd the convention for biological diversity which india became a member long term long back but in 2002 only it brought this national act okay so the main purpose of this act is to uh, ch you know sustainably use the biological resource uh, biodiversity as well as uh, you, you know share the benefit equitable, equitable sharing of benefit arising out of, out of these resources all the aim and purpose of cbd will be reflected in biological diversity act. these are some of the saline, saline features of the act you can see so uh, to access uh, you know the biological resource of the country and to share the benefit okay same way sustainably use biological diversity to respect and protect the knowledge of local community for then only you can try you will be sharing no so related to bio biodiversity and also to secure sharing of benefit okay all these are you can read it blah 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 the main reason is these three only then conservation and development of areas of importance from the standpoint of biological diversity by declaring them as biological diversity heritage site this is a different point all these are related to sharing of benefit protecting the knowledge of local people but come to this biological di di diversity heritage site now you are declaring a site as biological diversity heritage site and this act will do that and even the protection and rehabilitation of threatened species you know, how you, how iucn is doing uh, under this act india is also doing announcing certain species as threatened or endangered like that and uh, you know uh, okay this is not required committee then come these are some of the important sections under this act apart from that you can see that uh, see uh, that there are certain permissions or approvals we have to take from the body which is called as the national biodiversity authority which was which was formed under this act only around 2020 sorry 2003 this body was formed after the act gets passed okay so you have to take approval from the nba the national body or the state board under the body the state board also so uh, before accessing the biological resources the approval has to be taken for there are certain limitations like foreign companies or foreign nationals they have to definitely take the approval from nba before obtaining the resources okay and even there is certain modification recently brought under this act for indian uh, people especially like hakims you take the traditional medi medical practitioners you take okay whites these people and all need not take permission from the body and the nbas or even the state boards while accessing the resources like this there is some updation we have already done in our uh, classes you can just refer our classes so here these are some of the uh, approval related sections okay and even for uh, you know uh, approval of nba is required for any kind of research to be conducted on the biological materials also okay which is related to india then you have to take approval the same way the state biodiversity boards you can see this prior intimation to the state diversity board is required uh, for commercial purposes even indians who are extracting that uh, resource for commercial purpose you have to take from state biodiversity board i think now it is uh, uh, nullified no now you can do but it, it, you should not associate with the uh, multinationals a company uh, or uh, a foreign firm or your company should not be located outside also and uh, especially uh, you cannot use this biological resources to take uh, to take that uh, patent rights and all okay so that very they are very clear only for your own usage you can you take without any approval any permission you can try to uh, use that biological resources okay and uh, even nba i already told national biodiversity authority under this act only they got as established so the statutory status to this body was given by this act same way the national biodiversity fund we have that is also established under this act okay then uh, biodiversity heritage site already discussed even i told that notification of the threatened species apart from iucn which is an international body international union for conservation of nature apart from that uh, in our india based on this actly we are trying to the central government who will do it not the state government and all only the central government will do it they will consult with the state government and then from time to time they will notify certain species as uh, threatened species okay when they are in the verge of extinction they will ex uh, notify them as a threatened species and they will try to uh, you know protect this species okay 
even the committees biodiversity management committee even local biodiversity fund like this there are a lot of provisions under this act now we'll go go to convention convention on the conservation of migratory species of wild animals that is called as cms or the bond convention generally in shortly we call this as bond convention as you see this is also an uh, international treaty only an environment treaty treaty under un we have the treaty and mainly this is try this is a one and only convention in order to protect the migratory animals their migratory routes their range range country where they are present and all and their habitat now this can be protected under this convention only okay and all the terrestrial it can be aquatic species it can be avian flying in the sky you no know, birds anything will be covered under this convention okay give a statement like that this uh, cms is protecting only only the terrestrial species no it is protecting even a fish it's protecting even a bird which is flying uh, from uh, european uh, countries visiting uh, the asian and again returning to europe europe okay this way it is trying to protect and uh, you know this um, cms does not work alone it, it joins along with lot of international organizations ngos even private sectors is joining hands with the cms in order to implement them okay so that you can see Uh, this particular uh, is signed in 1979 in bond but it entered into force in 1983 so again year wise classification is important so uh, here under cms we already know about sites sites under sites there is appendixes same way under cms also we have two appendices okay in sites site that is another convention which we will be seeing under sites we are having three appendix but under cms only two appendix are there appendix one is talking about uh, species a migratory species that's a difference okay the migratory species which are threatened with extinction that is coming under appendix 1 as you can see this threatened with extinction so here high protection is given to those animals okay like uh, restoring their places where they live the movement the path if there is some blockage then they are trying to rectify all these problems related to the migratory species appendix 2 is talking about the migratory species that need or would significantly benefit from the international cooperation and uh, which are listed under this appendix 2 okay so there are two appendices and india became party to this convention around 19 at the moment it entered into force india became a party to the convention 1983 okay and uh, as of now uh, you can see that this much people member of uh, cms even india has hosted cms uh, meeting one time in gandhinagar gujarat that is cop ali told no when a convention or a convention is there especially the international convention you will see conference of parties they will be the decision making body also and they will meet yearly once some case rare of rare cases two years once they will meet so during the cop uh, 13 india hosted that cop 13 in, in uh, okay so they may say give the statement that india has so far twice hosted this convention meet cop meet of cms there might there is a possibility of asking in that manner okay so the convention on international trade in in this so far i have told no sites 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 that sites is convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora this is another convention you un convention only so you can see this this uh, particular sites is mainly uh, it's an international agreement which is between the governments i can say main the main aim for this um, convention the sites is to ensure the international trade uh, between fl flora and fauna either it can be an animal or it can be a plant but how you have to trade them based on that this sites was formulated okay and uh, they did not stop the you have to remember one thing sites was not brought to stop the trade in the species but to regulate the trade okay so that way you have to keep this in mind already upsc has asked question from sites but uh, you know uh, some it it may be repeated because again in the year wise classification sites is also coming that's why i have put here and it's a basic convention so you have to know about it and uh, this resolution was adopted in 1963 but it came into force in 1975 only okay and uh, as you can see it's a legally binding agreement only but it does not take place any national laws so one time they asked this as a statement as such only that if this convention is a internationally binding agreement but it do not replace any national law for that okay so rather then it 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 works along with the national law okay that you have to keep in mind and then sites is administered by unep united nations program is trying to uh, be uh, taking the administration of sites also and you can see that india has hosted sites also like cms india has hosted sites conference of party uh, at new delhi it has hosted and it also has a unique uh, you know um, 
features like a unique distinction we can say and elected as a chair okay of uh, the standing committee uh, even under uh, for three consecutive terms okay these are the three terms india has been um, appointed as the chair okay now we'll go so under the sites also we are having three appendices appendix 1 2 and 3 and if you see i told cms has two appendices sites has three appendices so appendix 1 is talking about the threatened species with extinction same no in migratory species threatened with extinction that was put under appendix 1 here the species which is threatened with extinction extinction is brought under appendix 1 and uh, the trade in these species no it's only permitted during uh, for some exceptional circumstances only we will allow the trade and appendix 2 it is talking about uh, not the th species threatened with extinction but the trade is controlled in order to uh, avoid the over use of these um, species and if it is done the species may undergo uh, extinct okay there is possibility in the future that type of species will be put under appendix 2 and then come to appendix 3 it contains that uh, species which are at least protected in one country and uh, india may protect that species but other country may not do it but india is protecting it so at least it has to be protected in one country and it, this country india will ask other countries no wherever the species moves then the india will also try to ask other country that please control the trade in this species and that way there will be a agreement will be made between two parties and uh, two countries we can say so in that way they will try to protect the species those type of species and all will be put under appendix 3 okay so this way there is some classification and as you can see now we will go to the national uh, uh, law a uh, wildlife protection act this time this is more expected because a lot of amendments also happen in wildlife protection act so far four times they have asked question from this repeatedly they have asked question from this act and it is again repeated repeating only so anyway we may expect that if there is a question it may appear from this act as you can see this wildlife protection act is mainly that to pro protect the wild animals birds plants anything okay so for the protecting the wildlife we have brought this act okay and uh, the important provisions on the uh, under this act if you see some pro provisions like no, any anyone they cannot simply go and you know damage anything or pluck or uproot or destroy any uh, particular plant okay from any forest land not only in the national park not only in the sanctuaries but any forest land or any uh, area which is notified by the central government if the central government has notified that area as a, a forest then you cannot simply go uproot anything you cannot damage the tree you cannot simply burn the tree you cannot pick up something so this and all you are and even possess or sell or offer for sale or transfer by way of gift or otherwise see this this line any specified plan you cannot simply give to the person whether alive or dead or parts are derivative thereof okay so there are a lot of restriction in that and um, see this will not uh, prevent a member of the scheduled tribe uh, for from picking collecting or processing because the main um, livelihood is that collecting the minor forest produce so you cannot simply stop them to do uh, but for their own personal use they have to do this uh, unless until they cannot simply go and damage anything okay same way uh, there is another section under this act which is talking about the power the wildlife warden has chief wildlife warden has that with, with the permission of this person only chief wildlife warden only uh, the um, any person take a permit to pick or uproot or acquire or collect uh, these uh, plants from the forest area okay you can take the approval from the chief wildlife warden or even if you're transporting it you have to take the uh, approval from the chief wildlife warden you have to do it and same way if that uh, uh, plant is mentioned under the schedules of wildlife protection act then a person cannot cultivate that plant except in uh, accordance with license granted by the chief wildlife warden as this is a statement you know you can cultivate that plant simply even if it is mentioned under the schedules of wildlife protection act you can cultivate the plant no you cannot unless until you take a license uh, from the uh, chief wildlife warden you cannot cultivate those plants okay which is mentioned under the schedules of the wildlife protection act same way plants are government property okay they asked one time like animals are government property there is a section which is saying plants are also government property only they may give this again repeated uh, again they may repeat it but they may say uh, animals are government property animal uh, only animals are government property this may they may slightly more and give that you may think that is right only because you already have uh, seen that question in your question paper and you have read that statement 
but there is one simple trick they have just added only animals no plants and animals both are government property only so every specific plant or plant derivatives dot 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 against anything we have already discussed no so uh, in the everything which 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 is mentioned under the schedules are to be the property only okay then uh, even that uh, plant or the parts or derivative thereof has been collected or acquired from a sanctuary or a national park which is declared by the central government such plants or derivatives will belong to central government otherwise if it is of any forest area it belongs to the st state government if you are taking it from a uh, see there is also a difference you now you have to note the sanctuary or a national park then it belongs to central government okay so there is a variation again declare what are the other things which comes under this important uh, provision which comes under this wildlife protection act declaring of sanctuaries declaration of national parks declaration of community reserves conservation reserves uh, constitution of central zoo authority all this is uh, uh, under this act only under this act is giving backing for all this uh, formations of sanctuaries, national parks, conservation reserve, community reserve, central zoo authority, national tiger conservation authority also under this only we have made. Even the tiger conservation plans, projectors and all under this only. Then constitution of tiger and other endangered species crime control bureau uh, WCCB that also under this act only we have uh, brought that body. So this way it is very very important this uh, particular thing they may say under that uh, wildlife protection act which are the things can be formed and they may give central zoo authority they may give that uh, the wildlife crime control bureau national ntca all are right only okay so be careful they asked one time with respect to the environment protection act they asked this huh? so then uh, even wild animals are of government property except those are called as vermins or they belong to a government property okay so that statement also there might be a modification when they are asking and then uh, the hunting rights no since it's a government property uh, except for the uh, sched scheduled tribes of andaman uh, that nicobar islands who belong to nicobar and uh, andaman and nicobar islands uh, all the others cannot simply go into a forest hunt an animal okay so there is certain restriction that is said as said under 11 of this act as you can see that there are certain uh, cases like the, this was asked already in the upsc same as such from the section they asked a question <laughs> but anyhow, I will explain here. The chief wildlife warden, if he is satisfied, I already told he has the most of the power in case of plant also, in case of animal also. So the chief wildlife warden has to sat get satisfied that this wild animal, no, which is speci specified in the schedule one under schedule one, has become dangerous to human life, or it is it has become so much disabled or diseased, you know, uh, some virus uh, or uh, bacteria has affected its body completely. Now it is in the uh, verge of dying. And uh, you, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, recover uh, this uh, species. Then you can. This person can order the chief wildlife warden can order anybody, uh, per, any person to hunt such animal, or uh, you know, uh, in a return order he has to give. Okay, uh, unless until he has to get satisfied first. If he is not satisfied, you know, just uh, just for that. He believed that okay this may become danger in that case he cannot give any permission he has to try first from every angle that to capture that animal alive or uh, to capture that animal alive and tranquilize him and capture him and then release him into the wild if it is not possible and if it is if he feels that it is completely disabled or completely diseased and he will not live long or he has become totally dangerous man eater and we cannot catch him alive at all in that case he has to be the animal has to be hunted down okay same way, which be where the animal belongs to Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. Same way, Chayachalef Warden or the authorized officer, if he is satisfied any wildlife specified in the Schedule 2, 3 and 4. Anna? So, if these animals has become dangerous to the human life or the property, then or to the crops, anything, property means crops or anything, or livestock, then and uh, if it is diseased or disabled they are be going beyond the recovery rate, then he can permit a person to hunt him. In the written order he has to give written order he cannot simply go and tell okay hunt it you cannot you know, in the proper written order he has to give so the killing of uh, same way if you are walking into the forest a tiger has bounce uh, you know on you and you cannot simply say all right tiger i cannot harm you you can in order to save your life you would have killed him okay so it's like for defense only you have done it okay it's not uh, something you have committed as an offense so if in such case you have to hand over that animal to the government you cannot simply carry to home 
and say that I already killed him. What is there? I'll take him home. Anna, oil the boar. He has bounced on me. I killed him. Now I am taking to home to have a feast. You cannot say like that. So you have to give to the government. Right. So uh, again, like that, you can see the grant of permit to hunt for special purposes. This also comes under as only. Okay. Certain sp snake species, they will collect you know, the specimens and all. And uh, for drug making, they require certain animals. For that, they will go and take the permission from the wildlife warden and they will hunt. Okay. Same way, the uh, modification which happened to the Wildlife Protection Act. Already in our in my sessions, I have explained it. I'm going it fast, uh, going fastly only. Only the highlighting point I'm going to do here. Otherwise, uh, I have done uh, in uh, in my regular classes. I have done it. You can see that. So the 2022 Act, you can see that recent modification which was uh, which was done is that sites was given much importance. Now I already told sites is a convention, international convention. And uh, the, for trade in endangered species of flora and fauna, this was highlighted under this act. For the mainly in order to implement the uh, provisions under the sites, uh, they brought a management authority. They have established a management authority. And this management authority is responsible for issuing permit, certificate. And, uh, when you are trading the specimens, then this person will issue the uh, permit and the certificates. Okay. Then comes the science. See, one is management authority. Second is scientific authority. So, this scientific authority, he will advise the management authority. He will advise this person related to uh, the survival of the specimens being traded or not. So, whether this you are trading this, whether it is going to affect issues or not. And even the ID mark, identification mark, which you have to use uh, to note a specimen. Uh, as per the sites, uh, sites has recommended it. So, uh, now uh, it, was in, uh, it was brought inside the Wildlife Protection Act also as of sites. Same way. This ID, ID mark cannot be removed or you cannot simply modify it. You cannot have a, a, in, a critically endangered species inside and you cannot simply say it's a vulnerable species. Both ID marks will be, to, will be totally different, no? So, same way, no such cheating is allowed. And without ID mark, you cannot transfer that specimen at all. In this way, there are a lot of restrictions now. Even the breeders of the species. Okay, note this point. Maybe from this, there might be a question. Breeders of species in Appendix, appendix 1 of Schedule 4. Required to make an application for license to the chief wildlife warden within 90 days of the commencement of the amendment. So, if you are, if that person is a breeder of the animal which belong to Appendix 1 uh, of the Schedule uh, 4, uh, and then he has to definitely apply for the license. Okay, within 90 days of that act which comes into force, he has to apply for the license. And uh, even, uh, you know, <coughs> see this. State government protected area and conservation protection of biodiversity. This all is not too much important. Then come to this particular point. The number of schedules should be reduced from C4. Now it is reduced. Previously we had six schedules. Now we are having only four schedules in that first three schedules is talking about the plants and animals. But the fourth schedule is talking about the site species. The site species are included in the fourth schedule. Okay. So now the schedule for vermin species is completely removed. And uh, now it is the authority of the government, the central government no, from time to time, they will think that, okay, this animal has an, uh, increased in an enormous level. Now it is time we have to kill it uh, in the mass level. So, cooling, we call this as cooling, mass killing. So, they will announce that particular species as a vermin species. Otherwise, previously we had a separate schedule for vermin species and now we have removed that schedule itself. So, now we have cut shorted or shortlisted the number of schedules from 6 to 4, okay. And even the control of sanctuaries, they have said that. The chief wildlife warden will uh, protect the sanctuaries as per that, uh, you know, he they will prepare a guidelines uh, from the assistance of the central government. Same way, the sanctuaries which are falling under the schedule areas um, are areas where Forest Rights Act is applicable, no, 2006 is applicable. The management plan for such sanctuary will be in, done with consultation with the Gram Sabhas. Gram Sabhas also should be involved in that, okay, because the Forest Rights Act itself is there to recognize the rights of the local people only, no. So, the forest dwellers. So, here the Grama Sabha should be considered. For the other areas, only the chief wildlife warden will prepare the plan as per the discussion with the central government. Then come to the this one. So, penalties has also been increased. Even uh, there is a new section which was uh, added. As per this section, any person who has a certificate of ownership for the captive animal, okay, or animal product you can take, he has to voluntarily surrender to the chief wildlife warden. Then he can walk away, okay. If you are possessing an animal, you which which is listed under the Wildlife Protection Act. And now, you even you, you might have possessed a certificate. 
what do you have to do? You have to give the animal, you have to submit that animal to the government and then you have to walk. So, no compensation, can, you know, uh, that is, that is you cannot pay any, you need not pay, pay any penalty for surrendering the animal or surrendering such items. You are having elephant tusk. You can just go and give to the government and then walk back, okay. Now, this will belong to the state government. After sur sur submitting then to the chief wildlife owner, state government will possess it, okay. Right, then uh, these are certain relaxation you can see, relaxing for, uh, relaxation granted for the film making and uh, even for uh, entering and residing in sanctuaries, all these are granted. And also the central government is empowered to uh, regulate or prohibit the import, trade, possession or proliferation of invasive alien species is also mentioned. No renewal of the arms licenses to be granted to the, any person who are residing within 10 kilometers of a sanctuary except under the intima intimation of the chief wildlife warden or the authorized officers, okay. Right, now we will go to the traffic. This traffic has been already asked in UPSC, but uh, it is also a very important body and uh, previously which was formed by IUCN, International for Conservation of Nature along with WWF, World Wildlife Fund. They both joined together and uh, introduced this traffic as a program in 1976. Later in 2017, the traffic became an independent NGO. Now it is an independent NGO and here was classification again is important. So I have put up about traffic, a, a few uh, statements related to it. So they may give traffic is a convention or it is a government body or it is an intergovernmental uh, uh, you know, uh, body and all. But you have to be very careful, it is an independent NGO. So this is a non-governmental organization working globally on trade in wild animal and plants in the context of both biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. They, what they will do, it is like a monitoring network only. They will monitor the trade which is happening in the, uh, sorry, which is happening related to the wild species and they will report this, okay, to various bodies or various uh, conventions like sites. They will report the trade which is happening for the wildlife species and uh, they collect the information and disseminate the information to various uh, authorities okay or enforcement agencies they will spread the information and that way they will stop the illegal trade which is happening on the wild species okay so that's about traffic then see this is another small topic ipbes that is intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services and again in uh, you know this came into um, establishment around uh, 2010 there was a discussion to establish this body and 2012 it was established as an intergovernmental body okay this body will give uh, the report by assessing the biodiversity okay so this report will be used and by the cbd the convention of biological diversity during the meet they will uh, use the report released by ipbs because it's a research oriented body Okay, so this body is an intergovernmental body where a lot of people uh, will be a participant of body like uh, even the UN members are uh, eligible to be a member of this body and even organizations can be a member of this body. Okay, so uh, at present there are 140 governments who are member of this body, okay, IPBS. Then come to Animal Welfare Board of India and uh, so Animal Welfare Board of India, we will see this AWBI. In the year wise classifications is again important which is established in 1962. This uh, Animal Welfare Board of India was established under uh, under the act called as Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Okay. So, be careful. Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Under this only this body was established. So, the um, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act gives statutory recognition to AWBA. Okay. So, the term of office of the members of this AWBA will be 3 years only. And also the main function and under, um, under which ministry it comes, under the Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairying only, this body was placed. The main function of this body is to stop the harm caused to the animals. Pains, suffering your, uh, you know, so infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering to the animal has to be prevented, has to be stopped, has to be combated. That only they brought this, uh, uh, you know, the body. Main functions are listed out here, okay. Prevention of cruelty. And to advise the government on the marking of rules under the act, sorry, making of the rules under the act and also to advise the government or any local authority or a person in designing of a slaughterhouses or the maintenance of the slaughterhouses and all will be advised by this body only, okay. And also the, it will grant some financial assistance to the uh, uh, body which is trying to establish uh, the rescue homes, animal shelters, for them they will help, okay. 
and also financial assistance will be provided to welfare organizations animal welfare organizations and all that no for the for their functioning they will give some fund okay uh, national biodiversity authority already year wise classification is important and national biodiversity act also i told it is important so you, you have to know some points related to national biodiversity authority they are, this was established in 2003 by the central government mainly to implement the biodiversity act 2000 and this nba is a statutory body only because there is a statutory recognition given by the biological diversity act and main thing is that the main focus of this nba is to advise the central government okay on matters related to the conservations of biodiversity or how well you can sustainably use the biodiversity and how you can share the benefits arising out of that you know the, for that purpose only we are having cbd also we are having uh, the biodiversity act also so the biodiversity authority's main duty or function is also to do all these things only yeah so then to this the state biodiversity board and even you can see the advice the state government is sorry the nba will advise the state government in selecting the areas to be an a heritage site biodiversity heritage site we are announcing no for that they will advise the state government and the state there is something called a state biodiversity board and also there is something called as local level biodiversity management committee so national level it is called national biodiversity authority state level it is state biodiversity board and local level it is called local level biodiversity management committees so the state biodiversity board it will focus advice on the state government the, the nb will advise the central government state board will advise the governments to guidelines issued by the related to the guidelines issued by the central government if the central government is coming uh, giving certain guidelines they will advise the state government okay you have to uh, prepare a program in this manner and all huh? uh, and even the issue, matters concerning the biodiversity uh, conservation of biodiversity sustainable use of its common uh, sharing of benefit all this will advise the state government nb will advise the central government stay sb sbb will advise the uh, state government okay and it also uh, regulate the granting of approvals or otherwise request for commercial utilization of our bio survey and bio utilization of any biological resource by the indians okay so the approval for related to indian people when they are approaching they want to take some approval for the usage of commercial usage of the already we discussed no commercial usage of the uh, bio bio resources then they will take ad, uh, approval from the sbb but there is some amendment which has happened so you need not go and take uh, for commercial utilization the indians need not take any permission okay so the local level biodiversity management committee which is responsible for in promoting conservation conserving sustainable use and documentation of biological diversity including the protection pre preservation of their habit everything dot 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 conservation of land race folk varieties cultivators everything so they will do at the local level so related to that conservation will be carried out by the local level biodiversity management committee so this is another one you can make a note on your bird life international uh, because we are going to see about iucn for iucn when they are preparing a red list so uh, related to birds the body which help them is called as bird life international okay so we have made a note but about bird life international but now we will see iucn only what is iucn iucn was created uh, in 1948 we created iucn so um, this is the most largest and the diverse envi uh, diverse environment network we can say like that <clears throat> okay so okay, it's a union so it, it does not only consist of uh, government but it's also consist of cso civil society organizations also all join together and work for the uh, sustainable uh, sustainable management of bio diversity okay. So now you see this um, it includes national government, subnational government, government agency, non-governmental, indigenous people, anyone can be a member of IUCN. Okay, in uh, around 1980 you can see the uh, UNEP and the World Wildlife Fund published the World Conservation Strategy which defined the concept of sustainable development, the World Conservation Strategy and uh, based on along with the iucn they these three bodies these three bodies join together and they publish the conservation strategy also and you can see based on this strategy only the 1992 years summit no in that three uh, we came out with three conventions all are based on all are derived based on this strategy only conservation strategy only the popular three conventions cbd unfccc and desertification okay and mainly if you see this uh, IUCN is also again funded to other conventions. Apart from this convention, other conventions like Ramsar Convention is there. Ramsar Convention, World Heritage Conventions, 
they are mentioned now. So, they may give this as a statement also. Uh, you see, and again, this year wise classification. So, be careful. And sites and uh, even CBD, everything, everything is based, uh, uh, dragged, uh, derived from this uh, um, IUCN only. Okay. And India became a member of IUCN around 1969. We became a member. And uh, after that, you can see Red List was pub published before India became the member. Around 1964, they published this uh, Red List. So, it is uh, the IUCN's Red List of Threatened Species, we call this as that. There are certain nine categories uh, they will assign for a species related to a species. If you take either a tree or a animal, they will ca categorize them. Okay, these are endangered species, these are vulnerable, these are near threatened, these are extinct. Like this, they will categorize. Okay, that is called as red list. Huh? So, you can see this. These are some nine uh, categories not evaluated, starting from not evaluated to data deficient, not sufficient data to assess it. And uh, least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild. Like this we are having and completely extinct. We are having nine categories. Okay. So, just read out. When you have time, you can just see there is a map inside the site of IUCN itself. They have given the, uh, the category, you know, how they have categorized these uh, people. There are certain criteria for that. Criteria A to E we are, we are mentioning for the endangered starting from you know, not leave all these things. This means there is no data. Uh, sorry, this means this has not started. We have not even started the evaluation at all. This no data. But starting from least concern to near threatened, vulnerable, if you are saying or you are saying endangered uh, or critically endangered. Okay, then there are certain criteria which is which it satisfies. Criteria A to E. For this criteria, you can refer the site. And uh, other than that, extinct in the wild. That this animal will not be surviving uh, in the while in the nature, you cannot find them except in the captivation. So, that is why extinct in the wild. Extinct means completely it is gone. Like cheetah and all completely gone. We do not even have in the captivity. Now, only we have borrowed from one country. Huh? So, uh, we only know about red list. Sometimes they may ask about green list. They may ask about green list if they are asking about IUCN. So, you, you can know what is green list. Uh, since very recently only they started giving this green list. Around 2012 they started. That means what? If a particular species is entering a green list, then what is the meaning of that? That means uh, that species is fully recovered and um, now it is present in all the parts of the ranges. For example, red panda, previously they were present throughout that uh, starting from the northeastern states, you know, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam and even West Bengal and even the northern parts of the Himalayas, you know, they were present uh, including the Bhutan and Nepal. In the stretches of the northern Himalayas, you can see them, especially the northeastern and the few parts, uh, not completely the northwestern, central uh, Himalayas and all, you can see them. But now, you can find only them in the restricted parts, restricted areas, you can find them. So, uh, when I am, uh, if suppose this red panda has become, uh, turned to its normal, let us consider. And if I want to add him in the green list, that means that red panda has recovered from and is present in the full range. Previously, it, it used to be spread in this manner. No, so now apart from one, now it is restricted to West Bengal. So now, uh, if if I am adding that in the green list, that means it has to be spread over in the normal ranges. Previously, it was present. Previously, where and all it lived, and uh, then it has to be found in those areas. In the entire stretches, you can you should see them. Then we can say that they belong. They, they have become green. Or it is viable that is not, not threatened now in all parts of the range if it is without any threatened then we can say or it is performing its ecological function in all parts of the range okay so there are three conditions three conditions not r r it should be plus 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 all should be satisfied okay they should be present first then they should uh, be not threatened not only present but they should not be threatened okay third they should also perform their functions in the particular range so, then we give a green score and we say that this particular species has completely recovered, fully recovered from their uh, threat, uh, you know, uh, threat. Okay. Then come to certain projects. Apart from uh, giving a national park, uh, you know, uh, sorry, so far we have discussed about bodies, acts, conventions. Now, uh, in IUCN we are taking, same way in our government, uh, national level also, we have introduced a lot of projects in order to protect certain species. We will see that then we will uh, discuss about the cat conditions for national parks, dis uh, assigning an area as national park wildlife sanctuaries that way we will see. We will try to finish this uh, biodiversity part. Okay. So, the project cheetah if you are taking, 
how you have to concentrate uh, because like project tiger is celebrating a, a 50th year anniversary but same time project cheetah because very recently we started introducing cheetah into our country again so then what is that project cheetah that is reintroducing cheetah that is called project cheetah where 50 cheetahs we have taken from the african countries and and now we have brought into uh, you know uh, partly we are not completely 50 will be entered once in this uh, single time not like that we have, we have taken few species nine introduced in uh, one national parks and then again we will be entering in another area so this way we are trying to take the cheetah and reintroduce them inside the uh, country again okay the first site which was selected for that is kuno palpur national park see uh, there might be a lot of doubt for you related to national parks when there are national parks in the exams i have not made since it's completely we have to do rapidly only one sample i have put up with the biodiversity but for the national parks and all what you have to do how you have to prepare you have to prepare by connecting the uh, you know you take a national park either any wildlife sanctuary which is present in the national park or not or it is present in any river basin okay in any particular if there is a river basin and this national park is present there or any rivers is flowing inside a national park any mountains ranges which are present in the national park and this national park specifically belong to which state any specific species which are protected under the national park this way you have to prepare from various angles related to national parks okay now cheetah is introduced into this why mainly two reasons one is the uh, that is proper ecosystem that is habitat which is required for the cheetah is present here in the kuno palpur in madhya pradesh second is that uh, the prey base prey it want to eat no cheetah has to eat they have to hunt and eat they are hunt so the, the prey also should be present here in that basis we have introduced this cheetah in the kuno palpur the later later future we may introduce naradagi gandhi sagar and all has been selected huh? in the future there might be a possibility for introducing inside this and even that uh, cheetah is also taken care by national tiger conservation authority only okay he is also a big cat no cheetah is also a big cat so ntca only looking after their conservation same way project tiger if you take it's an initiative which was started as a project and which was launched in 1973 so mainly to uh, uh, check the population uh, to increase the population to conserve and protect the tiger which is remaining and to uh, increase their uh, population for that only this project tiger was introduced okay so mainly they started this project in the uh, nine reserves okay so they it started with nine tiger reserves now you know it has grown enormously so started with nine tiger reserves in the states like assam bihar karnataka like they have selected around nine this is not, not him but the government has set up uh, you know ntca how project tiger got converted into a statutory authority like ntca uh, as we have already seen that under the wildlife protection act okay amendment happened in 2006 the protection act was started in 1972 itself uh, it was proposed at that time there was no, no such provision later they amended this act in 2006 and then they introduced a body called ntca and they said the project tiger will now be get converted to a statutory authority we are giving legal status to this body project tiger so in that way we can uh, give much protection for protecting the, the by uh, for protecting a safeguarding the tiger okay so then um, you can see tiger day is also observed every year they are celebrating around july 29 uh, they are celebrating tiger day only tiger day any day we are celebrating is to raise awareness about that particular species only okay then you can see that uh, this and all is not required come to the project elephant see very recently a film elephant whispers also came related to that and project elephant was also launched in 1992 so year wise classification you can uh, consider this project elephant also very recently gaj gaurav award was also granted so based on that you have to go through project uh, elephant a bit so it is also a centrally sponsored scheme only a project which was launched in 1992 by the ministry so main aim is to ensure the survival that is to safeguard the population of the elephants in their habitat okay and even the migratory routes and all you have to protect wherever the elephant is moving you have to protect it okay even creating awareness and conservation among the local people and improving the veterinary care for all these and to reduce the man animal conflict ana so for, and even poaching no mainly they are hunting the elephant for the tusk uh, they are killing the entire elephant so for that purpose only they started this project elephant and they also started announcing elephant reserves okay so they you know i even one time they asked um, like uh, you know uh, about elephant census from the elephant census one question was picked out 
and one statement was made under the elephant uh, from that elephant census. So be careful while reading this. And you can see that uh, this elephant reserve same like how tiger reserves are there. We protecting the reserve, the area where the elephant is residing and the movement. So from one place to another, they will move, move no. So migration, elephant will keep on migrate. So based on that, they are announcing this elephant resource and all. And then you can see this mic program. This mic program was, uh, you know, has been, this has been implemented by the sites only. Sites is implementing this mic program. Since 2004, they are implementing it. Again, you can see this, this is the 20th year. So be careful. Might be, there might be a question from, instead of asking about project elephant, they can come to Mike and Pike. So be careful about that. So Mike was established mainly for to, uh, you know, monitor the killing of elephant. That is why this is monitoring of illegal killing of elephants. That is called Mike program. Okay. So they will, they are giving an index also uh, called a spike. That is the proportion of illegally killed elephants. That is called Pike. Okay. It's an index. So how much elephants are getting killed? In that way they are releasing certain index. So that is called Pike also. And this is calculated on annually. Annually, they are calculating this and they are releasing this, right? Now, we are going to the Hathi Mere Sati's long term back they have introduced. So, you can just go through on your own. Gajyatra campaign, you can come. Gajyatra campaign was started recently uh, during 2017 only. So, again, uh, five years, but uh, not much important. But you can just read for what they have brought this campaign. So, this was started along with WTA and uh, the international fund for animal welfare they together started this project and along with the ministry of environmental process they they may give one and they may give different kind of organization here and they may say they have started this gajyatra campaign our ministry alone has done it okay so be careful along that for securing the wild elephant and the elephant corridors only they introduced this gajyatra campaign same way gaj gaurav award this time 2022 they introduced for the first time they have introduced and uh, one community has got this award Mainly this award is to uh, recognize the frontline staffs, no, like uh, those who are acting as mahouts, uh, they are working at the grassroots level, no, the, those people will be recognized and they will be granted awards, okay. So the local community will be given. So this year award was given to Malasar community belong to Anamalai Hills, they belong to Anamalai Hills, okay. So Anamalai Hills of Tamil Nadu and even the mahouts of Kerala's and Assam's along with this people the mahouts of Kerala and Assam are also given this Gaj Gaurav award by the ministry so be careful and plan B is small project last year it came in the newspaper same way like uh, B sound they are making near a track because most of all uh, what is the problem the elephant goes in the railway and get hurt no for that only introduce plan B Apart from this, there are enormous projects, but only these three projects we are expecting based on year wise classification and the way it appeared in the uh, newspapers. Okay. So then see this national park, told, national park, wildlife sanctuaries, and some other some more uh, protection sites we are we will be seeing. I do. Same way, this uh, national parks, if you are taking that an area within a sanctuary, see this line, within, whether within a sanctuary or not, it can be notified by the state government. The state government will notify that, will constitute as a national park. Okay, uh, based on the floral geomorphological features, they can announce that area as a national park. If that uh, area is within a sanctuary or even with the, outside the sanctuary, it can be notified by the state government. But uh, state government, if that state government has leased out or transferred any area, any area to the central government, then the central government will announce that area as the national park. Okay. So, both the government can announce a particular area as a national park. That only you have to know here, right? Then come to the next thing. See, no human activities permitted inside the national park except for the ones permitted by the chief wildlife warden. We all know that. So, there are certain conditions that they will uh, say this is not allowed, that is not allowed like that. There are a lot of restrictions that is not allowed inside a national park. Then, uh, all rights in respect of land will rest in the state government. And even no alteration of bodies of a national park by the state government shall be made except on the recommendation of the national board. That is, in order to alter the boundary of a national park, the state government has to take the permission from the national board. Okay, And even no person can destroy this. You all know that. They can not simply national park damage any uh, species inside the national park. Any wild animal, they cannot harm. Okay, So, this they have to take the permit of the wildlife warden. Then only they can enter itself. That and all is there. Right? Then come to the wildlife studies. So, wildlife sanctuaries are any area which are comprised within the reserve forest or any part of the territorial. See, this also. Either it can be a reserve forest 
or any air it can be a territorial water so you can announce that is as a wildlife sanctuary who will do it state government okay if they think that this area can be announced as a sanctuary they will announce it as a wildlife sanctuary and in case if it comes to a territorial water there comes the central government's inter uh, interference because the territorial waters if it is to be included the prior currents of the central government shall be obtained by the state government so they have to take uh, permission from the state uh, central government and there comes the uh, the limit of the area now the territorial waters means the limit of the area who will fix it that will be determined by the chief naval hydrographer of the central government he will uh, declare okay this much area you can consider for uh, declaring as a sanctuary okay like how we said for national parks no alteration of the boundaries we told same way no alteration of the boundaries of a sanctuary shall be made by the state government they cannot alter the boundary only the national board has to recommend if if that boundary has to be altered there comes a board like in the case of uh, uh, you know uh, um, that national park also the same only we said same every person shall so long as he resides in the sanctuary he has to report the death of the wild animal and to safeguard its remains until the chief life warden as uh, comes to take it uh, so if uh, there is an animal which has died in for you or you may just accidentally kill it uh, you have to wait for the chief life warden a uh, wildlife warden to come and take as a possession and then only you can leave and also you cannot tease or molest any wild animal even very re recently newspaper also it has come anteater somebody has ragged uh, the anteater and all so for that and all they are they are die to arrest these people okay so you have to be very careful and no person shall destroy exploit or remove you know uh, so they have you know you cannot simply go you cannot simply uh, destroy any wildlife i already told any plant any wild species including uh, uh, any uh, forest produce you cannot take it from a sanctuaries like uh, how you you are not allowed to take a national park you are not allowed to take from a sanctuary okay or you cannot simply divert any water bodies or any uh, habitat inside the sanctuary so you cannot do it right so this way uh, there are a lot of restrictions same as in the case of the parks and no explosives usage of explosives chemicals anything is allowed inside a wildlife sanctuary right and you cannot carry any weapon except the permission from the chief wildlife warden you have to take the right uh, written permission from the chief life warden or the officer authorized by him then only you can carry the weapon okay and uh, who and all who are allowed inside the wildlife sanctuary it is given here the chief wildlife warden will permit uh, you know see this uh, the some restricted human activities are allowed inside the sanctuary area details which are given here so what activities which are allowed uh, public servant who is in duty can, can enter as a sanctuary okay and uh, this the public servant need not take a permission from a chief life, wildlife warden to do his duty he will go inside and come out say. but other than that any person uh, who can, who's, who has taken permission from the chief life warden sorry chief wildlife warden can enter the sanctuary okay so who what for what are the purposes the chief life wildlife warden will grant permission these are some of the purposes like first one investigation or study photography scientific research okay tourism transaction of business inside that uh, national parks or sanctuaries so for that purposes residing in the sanctuaries the people who will be residing in the sanctuary one who comes from outside there is a business between both of them so for that person all prime permit is granted okay so these are some of the <coughs> reason for granting permission and uh, any immovable property which is there within the limit of the sanctuary for a person he can enter after taking permit from the chief wildlife warden even person who's passing through a sanctuary there might be a public highway national highway will be there so if he is going uh, in that uh, crossing the national highway then he can uh, he can go okay he can uh, take the permission from wildlife warden and even the dependents of the person who belong to the first section uh, second section and even class c okay so this way uh, the permission will be granted so he has the most power chief island wildlife warden uh, be the uh, shall be the authority who shall control manage and maintain all the sanctuaries and for this purpose he may regulate, control, or prohibit with the interest of wildlife, the grazing, or movement of livestock, etc. Okay, everything the permission has to be taken from the chief wildlife warden. Same way, you can see the community reserve and conservation reserve. See the community reserve and conservation reserve, like uh, you can say that uh, where the community, the community reserve first, if you take as um, the state government, the state government will declare any private or community land not comprised within a national park, sanctuaries, or a conservation reserve as a community reserve. Okay, for protecting the flora and fauna, 
and to conserve the value of that particular ecosystem. The state government will announce such area which is not coming under a national park or under a sanctuary or a conservation reserve as a community reserve. Okay. Then, uh, <coughs> no change in land use pattern shall be made within the community reserve except the resolution passed by the managed committee and approval by the state government. So, you cannot simply go and change something. You cannot practice any agricultural uh, slash and burn agriculture and all. So, there should be some resolution which is passed by the management committee. Then, you can see this, the state government will constitute a community reserve management committee for this. That is that committee. We don't know management committee, that committee. Who is treating it? State government only. So these are the members who will be present inside that committee. The five representatives from the village panchayats and, uh, you know, members of Gram Sabha, state forest or wildlife department. Way, these members will be present in the committee, right? Then, uh, conservation reserve. This is, uh, the state again, the state government has a power. Along with the local community, you can see the consulting the local community will declare any area owned by the government, particularly the areas adjacent to the national parks or sanctuaries and uh, you know where their protection is required. Those types of areas will be announced as conservation reserve. Okay. So, this uh, conservation reserve, if, if the land owned owned by the central government, then they will take permission from the central government and then they will make the declaration. If the land is owned by the state government, directly the state government will announce. Otherwise, they will take the permission from the central government and then they will announce it. Okay. Same way like how we have constituted a committee for managing this, the state government will constitute a conservation reserve management committee. Okay. So, these are the members who are present inside the committee. You can just give a reading and then this committee will advise the chief wildlife warden to manage or conserve the resource. Same way biosphere resource. This is another important topic. So, we will conclude the protection uh, measures. Even we have a lot of things you can do on your own, but biosphere resource you can stick. This is a special entity where we are announcing a particular area. Even last year they asked a question when you are reading about biosphere reserve, how I told about national park and wildlife sanctuaries. La last time they asked a question that they gave Agastya biosphere, uh, bio, sorry, Agastya biosphere reserve. Then they mentioned that wildlife sanctuaries, uh, reserve forest inside the Agastya Malay biosphere reserve as an option for you. So, imagine that type of questions are also used to asked by UPSC. So, be careful. When suppose some bias source appeared in newspaper, then you have to do very carefully whether there is some reserve forest or whether there is some uh, wildlife sanctuaries or national park which is inside this biosphere reserve, you have to uh, note and make of that. Apart from that, you have to know that any specific peculiar feature which is present inside this biosphere, any endemic species which is only present here inside the biosphere reserve, that and all you have to know. And now, uh, you can see this biosphere reserve is designated by UNESCO. Okay. So, for uh, especially you can take this was initiated by UNESCO in 1973 to 74 under the MAP program, Man and Biosphere program. Okay. So, this, this sites are mainly recognized under UNESCO's MAP program to promote the sustainable development only based on the low community efforts. So, that means local community will be joined here. The participation of local community is very important in order to protect the uh, biospheres, okay. There are three zones of biosphere reserves. As you can see, the natural, this, this is that figure. This is a core zone, okay. This is the buffer zone. The dark blue is buffer zone and this is the transition area. This, is, this green color has the highest protection. And only research activities is allowed inside this green act, green color zone. And then comes the dark blue and where there, apart from research activity, educational uh, purposes, people and training purposes, people can enter. Tourism, they can enter. And people are, even the tribals or forest dwellers will be settled in this zone. Okay. And even tourism activities and all can take place. Then comes the transition zone, which is having highest uh, protection measures, but uh, still a lot of activities like, you know, Settlements, crop lands, and all these are present in this particular uh, area. Okay, then comes uh, see this tiger resource you can do on your own, but there are two uh, part in the tiger resource you have to know. One is a core, like how biosphere reserve we are talking. Tiger under tiger resource also we have core habitat, uh, core tiger uh, habitat area, and another one is a buffer zone. Okay, buffer or peripheral area. So, one time UPC asked a question like when about talking about tiger reserve, they told that the core area uh, of this tiger reserve is present like this much area and all they have mentioned. So, you have to be very careful while reading that 
not for all you have to take care those which are there in the newses you have to be careful and i also said when you are doing a biosphere reserve or national park or wildlife sanctuary see that whether tiger reserves are present inside so this core uh, area where that uh, human activities are not allowed okay in the, it is inviolate of the human activities and uh, mainly for the protection of the tiger only they have created that so this is kept as inviolate for the purpose of tiger conservation okay at the same time the rights of the scheduled tribes or forest dwellers will not be affected that means it doesn't mean that they will live there that the rights for that if suppose the tribals were living in that area previously the right will be recognized and they will be settled nearby okay so that way there is some adjustments but by area where you can find uh, the people will coexist with the tigers okay so here if you want to say that uh, this see uh, to promote coexistence only they brought this and uh, this uh, area for the buffer area will be determined on the basis of scientific and objective criteria in consultation with the gram sabha and an expert committee for the purpose and no alteration in the boundaries of tiger reserve shall be made except on a recommendation by the tiger conservation authority so the ntca should come without their previously we told of a national park and uh, uh, all the other uh, wildlife sanctuaries all state government cannot simply alter the boundary except the uh, consultation with the national board same way ntc is the body which will give recommendation okay you can alter this now the boundary and all that way you have to take approval from the ntc okay so now um, see this biodiversity hotspots already it is asked in upsc you can do on your own these are the two conditions for biodiversity hotspot at least 1500 species of vascular plants should be found endemic to that area and that area should have at least Uh, lost 70 percent of its nat native vegetation. Then you will declare that area as biodiversity hotspot. Okay. So in India we have four biodiversity hotspot. One is the Himalayas, the Western Ghats, the Indo-Burma region, and the Sundar land. One time UPSC asked a question that there are four uh, biodiversity hotspots in India. They are Himalayas, Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, and the uh, Indo uh, Andaman Nicobar Islands. This way they have given. So the, the Eastern Ghats never comes under a biodiversity hotspot. Only the Western Ghats will come under the biodiversity hotspot. So Himalayas, Western Ghats, Indo-Burma region. In the Indo-Burma region, the Andaman group of islands will be coming. In like northeastern India as well as the the Andaman group of islands, except Assam. Assam will not be included in this. But the Sunda land you take. Sunda land uh, the parts of Nicobar Islands. So Andaman and Nicobar together is a, a biodiversity hotspot. Okay. So along with northeastern region, except Assam, all the other areas will come under this biodiversity hotspot. Then same way, E is it? I have done, done a separate video for this. Please go and watch that. We need not discuss here. Then we will go to the next one, uh, the last part of our discussion. We are coming to the last part. So this also last five years, five to six years, most of the questions, if you see, every year at least one minimum one or uh, you know maximum. Uh, two to three questions are appearing from this uh, particular sectors, and sometimes it even goes to four. Okay, uh, depending on the uh, importance in that year. That's something related to agriculture, I energy, or uh, even the in innovation. Okay, so for that, uh, lot of questions like they, what they will give. They will give certain uh, environment friendly farming practices. Okay, they will say which of the below are eco friendly practices, farming practices, or agricultural practices, or climate friendly agricultural practices. Like this, they will give an, a question and they will give options for you. Number one, uh, no tilling. Number two, mulching. Like this, they will give some techniques. This way, many times UPSC has asked a question. Or they may ask, what are the uh, positive benefits of uh, undertaking this type of cultivation, like rice intensification system cultivation? Or they may give like uh, organic farming. Uh, or uh, they may give green uh, agriculture. What may be the benefit of all these things? Okay, so this way the questions will appear. Or sometimes they are asking that uh, you know, um, okay, fine. What are the negative impact of the chemical use uh, fertilizers? Uh, in the form or what are the negative impact of overuse of water overuse of fertilizers this way you take your old question paper you'll face questions so you have to be prepared in every angle but this time uh, what has come in the newspaper like related to natural farming there is something called as natural farming in order to promote the natural farming the mission has been started under the uh, you know uh, krishi sinchai yojana and uh, in, under that sinchai yojana There is some other Pratikthik Krishi Padati BPKP is already a sub scheme under that. So based on under this uh, special attention was given to National Mission on 
natural forming okay that means chemical free forming that is called natural forming chemical free forming and uh, mainly in this natural forming they are depending on cow based products okay cow, cow based inputs uh, and that um, for that only they uh, brought this national mission on natural forming and uh, you can see this chemical free forming they may ask they may even ask about this natural forming they may give and give some uh, statement related to natural forming it's a chemical free forming which is based on desi cow and locally available resources with no chemical fertilizers okay and pesticides will be used in the farm locally what and all is available if there is a neem tree they will take the neem leaf they will uh, prepare a concoctions in the farm itself okay so even uh, cow dung and urine they will mix and they will use some techniques like mulching i told you and uh, recycling biomass recycling they will do okay so this way they will try to take every substance from the uh, farm and they will try to use as a fertilizers a pesticide or insecticide uh, uh, like this they will try to do something so in this way they are trying to reduce the negative impact of chemical fertilizer at the same time pro promoting the soil fertility okay so that way uh, they are trying to bring uh, address this uh, natural farming so this year uh, there might be a possibility of either asking about natural farming or uh, the benefit of natural farming or they may ask about the scheme also even there was one scheme very recently they have introduced pm uh, pranam okay make a note see i have a space here i'll write here pm pranam to protect the health of mother earth they have introduced this uh, it's something alternative nutrient scheme okay for uh, agricultural management they have introduced the scheme in this scheme they are trying to move from the uh, chemical fertilizers they are moving to the nano fertilizers okay they are moving towards bio fertilizers organic fertilizers there is a difference between all the three there is a difference anna so in my session i have done this you can also see that what is the difference between some nowadays they are asking that no bio fertilizers they are giving certain uh, uh, types of bio fertilizers below along with the, the chemical fertilizer and asking you to separate it bio fertilizers where living organisms are present in the fertilizers like uh, rhizobium bacteria is a bio, bio fertilizer but organic fertilizers the resultant of the microorganisms vermicompost all these are organic fertilizers same way they are talking about the uh, nano fertilizer nano fertilizer is something very exceptional that uh, you know the size is also very small easily absorbable and uh, even the surface area is uh, very uh, is a lot comparative to the chemical fertilizers so in this way even they are extracted from the plant uh, parts okay that way they are very important then the national mission for sustainable agriculture this is also important it's a sub scheme under the national action plan on climate change it's this itself is celebrating a year wise classification so under this the national mission for sustainable agriculture was introduced okay this is to promote a green agriculture that is called as a sustainable agriculture okay where good agricultural practices will be followed that uh, like for example rain fed harvesting the rain uh, uh, even uh, trying to increase the soil health soil health management soil health card even the organic like parampragat krishi vikas yojana is trying to promote organic farming okay that way they are trying to improve the uh, improve the you know per drop more crop like this we are trying to uh, pro conserve the resources at the same time increasing the fertility of the soil and reducing the negative impact of chemicals used in the farm so this way is promoting and come to the energy sector if there is something related to biogas okay or uh, bio 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 one time upsc asked about bio asphalt uh, bio toilets okay uh, like this the uh, even biofuels they are attracted to these so biofuels already a lot of questions has appeared from biofuels uh, from the biofuel uh, policy itself we do have but now in india has proposed for biofuel alliance so make a note about biofuel alliance there might be a possibility and uh, now come to compressed biogas cbg this also i have done in decisions but uh, what is cbg i mean know about cng okay cng is simply uh, uh, from the biomass we are extracting the cng okay that uh, the main difference between cng and the, uh, cbg cbg and cng cbg is compressed biogas so how what is the difference see this cng consists of all these things there is impurities there is dust there is dirt and there are pollutants like carbon dioxide uh, you know hydrogen sulfide all these are present in the uh, cng because cng how it is coming out by uh, through the biomass only the waste the sludge uh, the uh, you know you know you take the um, uh, slurries even the uh, municipal waste you can take okay the anything a food waste 
uh, any litter, any kind of litter you can take, uh, that waste you are trying to uh, treat the plant, okay, uh, so that the, it is digested and then this biogas is released out, okay. When this is released out, it comes out with impurities and then we call this a CNG, but uh, in case of compressed biogas, we are going to purify this CNG. Purify the CNG and we are going to only uh, take methane out by removing the carbon dioxide, impurities like carbon dioxides and even the water content also is removed along with hydrogen sulfide and ammonia and this is expected to be a pure gas than the CNG. Okay, So, for that purpose they are going to uh, replace CNG in all the places. So, in this way we can uh, wisely manage the waste also at the same time we can also uh, reduce the greenhouse gases emissions. Okay, So, that is uh, the main aim of CBG. So, then you can see, uh, yes, bioplastics. This the last topic which I want to introduce. Even you can add and uh, make a note about biosolids also. Biosolid, okay, it also came in the news. If you want, you can make a note about it. So, bioplastics, like it, I told about science and technologies and all. So, when a question is appearing from this field, uh, you have to be very careful that uh, new inventions. So, now the, the, the world is talking about bioplastic. Previously, the plastic is the main problem. No, even India this year has in, uh, extended the uh, EPR, that is extended producer responsibility. No, EPR. Previously, we had for e waste. Now, we have extended it for the plastic waste also. Okay. Plastic packaging is uh, included under the EPR, extended producer responsibility. Guys, has applied, is applied for that also. Same way, we have we started to ban the single-use plastic. A certain single-use plastic materials are banned in India. Anna? So, from 2022, it is completely banned. That case, that case, they may turn towards bioplastic. So, what is bioplastic? Plastic means those plastics which can be either bio-based or which can be either biodegradable or which can be of both which has both the properties. Either it can be bio-based or it can be a biodegradable one or it include both the properties. That means bio-based means the plastic which are extract, which is which is extracted, the material, the plastic which is made from a material which is extracted from the plant parts. That is called bioplastic. Like cellulose we are extracting from a plant. We are using in making, uh, we are using that for making the plastic that is called bio-based. Biodegradable means undergoing certain process where the plastic will get digested by the microorganisms that we call as biodegradable plastic. It does not mean that all bio-based plastic should be a biodegradable plastic and it does not mean that all biodegradable plastic can be a bio-based plastic. Okay? So, even a chemical, uh, a plastic which is made from chemicals can get biodegraded but a plastic which is extracted from a part cannot get degraded. Biodegradable means breaking into small pieces when it is released into the environment. Okay. So, this bio-based and biodegradable. Sometimes it includes the bioplastic can include both these uh, features also. It can be bio-based also, it can be biodegradable also. Okay. So, now these are some of the benefit of using bioplastic that it reduces the carbons uh, because most of all we are uh, using petrols, petroleum products. Uh, uh, plastic is derived from petrols only, so that uh, byproduct of petrols only. So, in our you know, we are deriving that uh, raw material from a plant. So, in that way, we are reducing the carbon footprint and we are also reducing the usage of fossil fuels. Okay, so energy is also saved in the production mechanisms, and uh, even uh, you know, uh, waste, waste has been reduced a lot, and sometimes. This is getting biodegraded also. The main problem now with the plastic is that it is remaining longer time no, in the environment. So, main problem is that. So, that can be rectified the introduction of bioplastics and they also do not have harmful additives which are going to harm the health of the uh, people. Okay. So, bisphenol A. One time UPC asked, uh, gave bisphenol A and they gave certain statements related to that. Okay. So, be careful. Even PET. Last year, they asked about polyethylene terephthalate, PET bottles. That is also related to plastic only. So, when they are asking, they will give the statements related to PET. This, uh, the PET bottle, now alcohol can be served in PET bottles. Okay. Uh, so, that way, because the, the, it made, the, it came in the newspaper that certain states banned uh, selling liquor in the uh, plastic part, bottle. So, you have to be very careful while reading that uh, particular article. And when you are going to use this kind of plastic, which is made from the plant parts, 
that the flavor of the food will not get changed which is to this containers no the flavor or scent will not get changed okay so this way we can see uh, the usage of the bioplastics in uh, various ways and there is one more topic which you can make notes on your own called as biooltics okay biooltics make a note of it in one of my video i have already discussed about the biooltics uh, we are expecting this year this may come because this year uh, the um, uh, you know uh, in india this project is already international level this project was existing but in india uh, the project was introduced by the arid zone authority in rajasthan especially icri is in, has introduced uh, this biovoltics okay inside rajasthan in certain uh, small uh, villages they have introduced okay so mainly this project is to uh, uh, encounter the drier regions of the world in order to conserve the water this helps a lot that means using solar panel inside farming activities solar panels will uh, give uh, shade to the plants at the same time the cleaning when we are cleaning the solar panels the water will also be used up for the plants okay so this way you can manage water in the drier regions at the same time the transpiration rate also gets reduced and the solar energy which is get generated is used for farming activities this way we are getting benefit in uh, all the way angle so make small note about biovoltics because this year this project was started by i don't, don't remember the authority name completely but they are arid zone authority only the rajasthan they have introduced as a uh, project the biovoltics so there is a possibility of asking this question so be careful and surf about it okay so so far we have done completely the four uh, uh, you know rapid revisions we have done already we have done it rapidly only uh, but because this is mainly to benefit for those students who are going for your prelims appearing for your prelims examination don't panic don't get fear at all there is nothing much which is come everything is from your syllabus only it is going to appear okay just take it simple and easy if you are fearful you will never be able to uh, you know sort out the questions you will never be able to uh, first of all read and understand the question that's the main thing which is behind this prelims and all so there is nothing which is going to come out or some alien words will is going to appear in your question paper everything will be in the simple manner only but you should know to understand them and coordinate so far you have read everything so you should know how to apply it that's the only mantra you have to follow previous classes and all we have done respective topics uh, that's for, for that is why for your own advantage i have split this entire environment into four syllabus four parts okay accordingly only questions are also distributed so this area i have already i should have clubbed it with the, the, the energy sector and all i should have clubbed it with the climate change because since climate change is a big vast subject vast vast area i just put it as a separate one and i club this with the biodiversity otherwise what do you have to do you have to study from this angle only while you are revising also do it in this angle you started with the basic concepts like the ecosystems general concepts flow of energy okay and that also i have mentioned in the video itself which are the part which you have to give focus which are the uh, important sections under that that only you read the nutrient cycles all this will come then you have to go to ecosystems classification there the different types of ecosystems you have to take you have to read them okay in that also certain ecosystems is very important and the bodies are acts or conventions which are related to protection of that particular ecosystem you have to give focus next part is related to biodiversity under the biodiversity also i have told you how you have to prepare your notes how you have to be ready you know be prepared for yours so recent amendments in any act or any convention which was brought or any alliances which was formed recently this way you have to be very careful and uh, for more elaborate reference you can take my book and then you can refer that okay in that i have elaborated i have splitted the entire syllabus in this pattern only for your easy references i have made in such a way you can read again okay so this will be uh, the highlighting point and then the last one is the climate change okay and the uh, associated issues related to climate change pollution all these types of issues you will be seeing okay along with that you have to know how to prevent or mitigate the climate change and uh, the uh, pollution related issues and what are the bodies which are responsible for it any new body which is in the newspaper maybe the teacher might have missed out but you would have followed it so be while revising also you keep in touch in that manner only okay so this way you have to be always uh, ready and all the best for all of you so we hope that you will be joined with us for a mains preparation also so do well
do uh, be uh, calm and quiet and analyze and uh, follow the heart while you are trying to analyze the questions already you are prepared already you know everything so be in that mind mentality be in that mindset don't think that what i am going to do i am very fearful and i panic nothing will come in your mind so be quiet and calm and do in such a way so happily go attend the exam and be happily come and join with us for your next stage preparation yeah all the best uh.